This is Twit. Some say, I don't know, is it hyperbole, Mike Masnick, to say the fate of the Internet rests in the hands of these nine justices? Well, potentially, it, it may depend on what they what they have to say in ruling about these cases. Justice but, Kagan, uh, when she in the uh, I listened to the oral arguments, which is great fun. Uh, Kathy Gellis, your uh, your contributor, was there in the room. Yep. She's admitted uh, to the Supreme Court. Um, Justice Kagan at one point said, "These are not the nine greatest experts on the internet," <laughs> and I and the and the room la burst out in laughter, which I didn't. I don't think is very common in the uh, in the chambers. But uh, she was, and, and other justices felt the same way. Admitted that this is a big decision. So there were there were two of them, but this was Gonzalez versus Google, the family of a young woman who was killed in, you know, tragically killed in Paris uh, in an ISIS terrorist attack. For some reason, the family decided to blame YouTube, even though there was no direct causal connection. And in particular, the YouTube algorithms recommending ISIS videos, radicalizing uh, people. Uh, and it really threatens Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, this 26 words that some say saved the Internet, made the Internet, that say that uh, uh, you're not responsible, whether it's a website or a, a chat room or our discord or our mastodon instance we're not responsible for the content people or youtube post there uh that is not something we're publishing so we it gives us two rights one the right to leave it up two, the right to take it down we can't be sued for either right is that a fair you you have the best page on tech data. <laughs> somebody has directed you to this page on section 230 because you got it wrong and it's commonly <laughs> wrong in fact i saw a mastodon toot from you saying would somebody please refer the new york times to me before they write about section 230 because they just get it wrong why what is it that people get wrong why don't they understand this there are so many things that they get that that people get wrong about 230. It's it's hard to to summarize them in a in a short form. That's that's one of the reasons I wrote that article that has all these different things. And and what's funny is people get it uh, you know wrong based on on what they want the law to be. Often the exact opposite of what it is. You know, some people think that if you if you moderate too much that you lose your 230 protections, for example. Which you know the law is actually explicitly the opposite of that. It's so you that, can moderate. Exactly. And it was it was put in place because of a case that that said the opposite, that there was, you know, Prodigy was this company that, that had moderated and lost, uh, you know, and, and what became liable for content on their forums because they had moderated and 230 was designed to protect that and, and fix that, that. Ron you know. Wyden, by the way, second name time we've mentioned him, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> is the guy who wrote 230. And he kind of felt like it was needed because of the CDA. Like he said, well, we got to carve some some safe harbor out for the internet so that people can publish so they can have forums they can have communities yeah and and it's you know it, it is a really it's a very simple law in in concept which is you know this idea the, the real idea behind it is that you want to put the liability on the party who actually did the whatever is violating the law uh rather than the tools that they use and you know if, if you think of it that way then it becomes a, a pretty straightforward it and makes pretty, sense yes Right. Uh, and, you wrote and, it. <laughs> and, but for whatever reason, uh, people have a lot of trouble with it. And they just really believe that, you know, especially in, in this case, you know, the real focus of, of the Gonzalez case was whether or not the algorithm, the recommendation algorithm is protected by 230 or not protected by 230. That, that was uh, one. And I have to say, I came around a little bit. We had a d bit of a debate. Uh, Jeff Jarvis spanked me on This Week in Google because I said, well, couldn't you? I mean, look, no one loves these algorithms. These algorithms are, are are there to make more money, to make more sticky content, to promote content that keeps people watching. And and not I'm not saying it's intentional, but inadvertently, as a result, they tend to push more extreme content, more and more extreme content because that keeps you engaged. So shouldn't they be liable for that? So there are a couple... 
a couple a couple things on that. One, one is, you know, whether or not they actually do push more extreme content is there's there's less and less evidence of that. There were a couple of reports from from seven or eight years ago that suggested that there have been multiple studies in the last like three to four years that have actually suggested that's not true, that what the companies have discovered to some extent is that if you're just pushing people further and further down an extremist rabbit hole, that's actually not good for business. It's your advertisers get kind of mad about well, it. that's true. Uh, huh? Yeah. Look at, you know, look users at Twitter. Get, yeah, users get angry and and start to to go elsewhere. You know, there are all sorts of reasons why companies actually don't. You know, the, you know, there is this belief certainly that algorithms are only negative and, and bad. Um, you know, and the reality is that for the most part, the you know many algorithms are actually somewhat helpful. Um, you know, I think I think the internet would be a lot worse without many of these. Well, there was an amicus brief filed by Reddit moderators. Yep. who said without algorithms we couldn't do our job not you know and this was the problem and you know what's interesting the justices actually seem to get it even i was surprised brett kavanaugh uh basically said you know this isn't for us to decide this is for congress to decide uh yeah. justice clarence thomas said algorithms you gotta have algorithms without algorithms there's no internet uh, he, he likes those weird analogies. I think he talked about a pizza <laughs> joint or something. But in any event, he got he got it. I, I was kind of impressed. Um, it's, yeah. It's, I, I mean, it's go ahead, it, it is an interesting question that that point that, you know, without algorithms, you can't have the Internet. Obviously, we had the Internet before algorithms when moderation was done manually. It does not scale. It just doesn't scale. Human. We had Yahoo, yeah. right? Yeah. Yahoo was done by humans. Yeah. But it was quickly but, superseded by Excite, Alta Vista, and eventually Google who used algorithms. And it is an interesting question. It, it, is an algorithm, is it speech? Is it conduct? Is it a product feature? And there is a case it has that I don't believe has made it up to the Supreme Court. It's being considered by a court in Georgia uh, about Snapchat getting sued over a speed filter that showed how fast you were oh, going yes. when, you, when you posted used, a Snapchat I used story. that on the Shinkansen in Japan to show how fast I was going. But unfortunately, people also use it while they're driving. Right, and and the the point by the made by the plaintiffs, I believe, was that this encouraged people to right. you know use their phone while Drive driving. Recklessly. Which is, yes. Which is, right, and you know, um, is it uh, Snap ended up pulling the feature, making it kind of a, a moot point going forward. But that principle of you know is a is the way that a a site that happens to host speech by its users, uh, the way it operates. Is that itself speech by the publisher of the site? Is it tied into the speech of its users, or is it you know, or is it something be, besides speech? I think that is a fair and interesting legal question. Uh, but I'm I'm sure it's, Mike and Alex have thoughts there. Right? Yeah, it's I mean it, it's it's a tricky thing, but it gets back to this this simple question of who who is the one who is actually violating the law, and and what is the 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 law that's being violated and how is it being violated? So you know I. The, the the snap case uh, in terms of the speed filter, I actually think there have been a couple different cases with that same sort of fact pattern. And I, I think the one that has gotten the most attention, which is uh, snap v. Lemon, um, I think that was decided in incorrectly, where they said that, that snap doesn't get 230 protections. Uh, that case is then gone back and is it's currently in discovery about whether or not snap is actually liable this was one of the mistakes that the new york times recently made in, in their reporting they said that the court said that snap was liable which has, has not actually been determined in, in a court yet um you know so if you look at that case as an example you know what is it that snap is actually doing right so they have they have created this filter that tells you what your speed is is that encouraging speeding you know, that's kind of an open question, you could say. But even if it was, is that by itself violating the law? Is encouraging someone to speed by itself violating the law? It's not. So, you know, the idea that there's some sort of legal liability here beyond that uh, doesn't really make sense. The person who is violating the law is the person who is actually speeding. And so, you know, putting the blame on the person who's actually speeding is the, the right thing to do. And all that 230 does in, in these cases, you know, in this case, it, they got around 230, but, you know, is make sure that you're talking about putting the legal liability on the party who's actually taking the action, which violates the law. Right. But, but Mike, product liability, you know, does not, product liability law does not forbid you to manufacture a product that could be dangerous. It's, it's all a question of when you discover that the product is dangerous, 
who's well, at fault. Here's a, a similar example. Who's responsible if a Tesla running full self-driving uh, causes a fatality? Is it the driver who used the full self-driving? Under your argument, Mike, it would be, but I think Tesla advertising full self-driving when it clearly doesn't work might give them some liability too, right? It's right. What if you take advice from chat GPT? Yeah. Oh, there's your problem right there. Uh, the, 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 the court in the Lemon versus Snap said, well, Snapchat made a product that was unsafe, in effect. Um, and, which and, doesn't and seem hard. unreasonable I mean, so, to me. So, I mean, yeah, and, right, and, and, you're, and, and you're free to make products that are unsafe. It's just you will be, you'll be um, liable for liable. it. And clearly yeah. the kids who, right. you know, caused the fatal crash were the, you know, the main culprits. But and it's it's Snapchat but it's does also, have a responsibility. I does don't they not to make stuff that encourages well, bad behavior? I, I don't know. But I, but I think that it's 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 one thing for you to build a tool that actually generates behavior, which is which is what all tools do. I mean, you know, you we oftentimes say when we're talking about measurement is that you don't measure what matters. What you measure matters. <laughs> it becomes something that's important. And if you look at if you talk to YouTubers, for instance, they are, you know, they are obsessed with the algorithm. You <laughs> know, like they are obsessed with. What does the algorithm do with when people watch this a certain amount of time? How does it handle the, right. the thumbnails? How does it do all these other things? So they, they behavior is definitely driven by those algorithms. Um, and so the thing is, is that that's when you're generating those things, if it's generating bad behavior, that's one thing. But then the other side of this is like when people put things on TikTok that are dangerous, um, you know, do you have a, I think part of this is, and this is where 230, I think, comes into a little bit more of a situation is it, when, when you're creating something as a company, you're still probably liable. When you are um, allowing content to go onto your site that is driving people towards a behavior, you know, some kind of herd behavior that is damaging, are you liable for that? Um, now, I think that, I, I think the idea of tampering with 230 is terrifying. Like, like there's, I don't think that there's any version of this, any way that you can unwrap 230 in a way. And I feel so strongly about it that when someone on Twitter or somewhere else posts anything that's positive about like un dismantling or even tweaking 230, I immediately make an intelligence decision about them. <laughs> like, 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 you know, like, <laughs> oh, I, agree. I, I disagree. It's not like I disagree with you. It is. I will never believe You're an you idiot. <laughs> on anything ever again. Like, like, you know, like, like it is the, the, you know, there's I this, guess you know, I, a lot of times we, we, we think of risk as the chances of something going wrong multiplied by the consequences. Like that is the math of risk, right? And the chances of something going wrong are mediocre, medium, but the consequences, consequences are catastrophic. Yeah. You know, like, like, you know, like, and you're just talking about fiddling with something that we've built an entire, and whether it was perfect or not, it doesn't matter anymore. Well, actually, that was interesting. That. One we of the judges, I think that. it was Kavanaugh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, did in effect say that, uh, that the consequences to the economy of changing 230 yeah. could be dire. Yeah, that, that was Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh, honestly, and I, and I wrote this, you know, I'm kind of hoping that he writes whatever the decision is out of this. Uh, and I, I would not consider myself, generally speaking, a Brett Kavanaugh fan. Uh, but I was, you know, he, he's ruled on a couple cases that sort of touched on Internet and free speech issues and really actually does seem to get that and uh, to, to get the deeper nuances here. And that became clear in the oral arguments uh, in, in both of the cases last week that he really seems to recognize that that getting this wrong will have massive, massive consequences for, for both speech and for sort of economic development and innovation. And so he he's the one who seems most spooked by the the, the possibility of getting this wrong. Uh, and I think that's, that is the right attitude to have. Yeah. Is it, but is it, is it, is it possible to narrow section 230 ah, without, that's a good question. without, um, without overturning it? You know, um, like, not, not that I've seen. Like, I, I, of course, I am, I am open to the idea that that is possible if somebody could show me a way to do that. And to date, nobody has shown me a way that doesn't really obliterate the entire law. Every sort of narrow change to 230 that I've seen in reality obliterates the law. And 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 Kathy Gellis, my colleague, wrote a piece uh, a couple of years ago, I think, that, that effectively said that, which is that, you know, a any reform to 230 really is a repeal to 230. And and this gets in, somewhat into the weeds, but it, it's sort of how 230 actually works and, and what the mechanism is, because I think people sort of get confused by that. The reality is that Section 230 is the sort of, you know, uh, procedural benefit that gets rid of frivolous cases 
very early on. And if you change that in any way, all you're really doing is asking people to have to go through long and expensive uh, court processes in order to prove that they were right in the first place. And and once you've sort of opened up the legal process and the expensive- This reminds part, the me of, of fair use. There, there, there are there are fantastic similarities to sort of the fair use thing because fair and, use and the, means you go to court, right? I mean that's the the famous Larry Lessig line is fair use just means the right to hire a lawyer, yeah. right? Because that's that's all it is, and you're going to have to fight over it. And because of that, what happens? We really don't have fair use. It's we don't a chilling have clear, effect. Yeah, it, I am very careful yeah. about what we put on this podcast because YouTube will take it down, even though it's fair. I know it's fair use. And if right. I asked them, they'd say so. Certainly a lawyer would. doesn't matter. It's a chilling right. effect because I don't going to go to court to defend it. Right. So, so almost any reform, and I would say every reform that I've seen of 230 uh, really does that. It basically just means you're going to have to go through a very long and very expensive court process, which means many companies won't. They'll just back down. Oh. And it sort of gives, gives people a heckler's veto uh, that would stop whatever it is those companies are doing, that's a really whether good, it's good or bad. That's an excellent point. <clears throat> because just even slicing a sliver off means suddenly, well, now the court has to decide. So right. you you really by 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 not keeping it a an integral whole, the the whole is what protects you against frivolous lawsuits. Any sliver does that make sense, uh, uh, Owen? That any sliver then now suddenly we have to adjudicate. Well, I think you know I. I I think that Mike does an excellent point. Uh, Mike does an excellent job of untangling like so what good, is actually in Section Two Thirty, yeah. you know, yeah. versus say the First Amendment. Um, and you know, they definitely are intertwined in that you know, like your First Amendment right to put something on your website or not um, is kind of you know is fundamental to understanding how Section Two Thirty plays out. But um, you know, I, I I do wonder if if what we're at, what we're after is the underlying um, speech or conduct and putting the, you know, putting the right responsibility, the right liability where it belongs. Um, we do have to look at these cases where it's, you know, is this really speech? Is this really, you know? Well, and, and I would say, what? and this is more about the snap versus lemon case. You don't want a carte blanche to let companies create anything they want and, you know, you do want some product liability. This, I mean, you don't want to say Section 230 extends so far that a company could do anything it wants, and if somebody does something stupid with it, it's their fault. I think that I think that the thing is, is that the company's doing something is one thing. Their user's doing something. So I think that's the important piece is when their user puts something on their site, then that protects the company from that. When the company does something, and, and I've worked with a lot of these companies, and so they, they they pay a lot of attention to liability because generally if you, this is a very different thing. Well, and that in, was in the Dallas debate, case, though. You're talking about claiming. That was the yeah, debate I mean, in I court was, did Google's algorithm, was that the company doing something, right? Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, it's it, 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 the company creating a product that, affects many, many things and may inadvertently affect something that they're continuing to work on, I think is one thing. Them creating a contest that obviously drives people towards a, an unhealthy behavior is a different thing. And I think that the, I, I do think that an algorithm that is generally working for most people and happen to do something which they haven't even proven yet, um, which is probably, you know, something that is very hard to, to, to plan. And again, I think that, I think the 230 is, is imperfect. I think that it probably could have been written better with hindsight. They were writing it. We have to remember that 230 was written when they had no idea what was, what was going to happen. Like it was, and so now we've built, it's, it is, but now it is a cornerstone, you know, or a, you know, of, of a giant building, which forms the world's economy. And you're talking about like, well, that thing was a little, little off here. It should have been. Why don't we just take this centerpiece, there. this part out of it? And, and oh, if it, Again, the consequences is man, we don't get it right. It'll have the like the, the entire building corner falls over. <laughs> so, so, you know, like yeah. so, you know, it's like it's like saying it's like like yeah, I think we I think we're gonna change um, and have the the uh, gas be something slightly different, and all engines and all um, you know all gas stations have to change if we do this, or someone can pass a law that forces everybody to change everything across the United States. Now you're talking Formula um, One. That's a different matter. No, but, I mean, but, the, but, but we're going to change the formula of gas and we're going to just say that that's going to, you know, we'll just tweak it a little bit and see how it works. And, you know, it's a big economy that, that you're, turn, you're, you're starting about turning over. So I think that, I think it's so dangerous. Like it is, it's just, it's, it's again, what we call fissionable material. Like you, you could really cause so much damage.
there, there was a quote I saw yesterday that uh, Section 230 is the the load bearing wall of the internet, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I, I think there's some some truth to that. And and just to, to to make up an important point here, you know, when you start to talk about the difference between speech and conduct, which is where a lot of these discussions are going, and, and sort of where where I think Owen was going with his comments, and and where like the Julia Angwin New York Times opinion piece last week was saying, oh, separate out, uh, you know, speech and conduct. Um, you know, the problem is that every single plaintiff and every single plaintiff's lawyer know exactly what they'll do in that case. And that is they will declare everything to be conduct rather than speech. And then you're at that point that I was talking about where you have to litigate it. And once you have to litigate it, you've lost all of the value of Section 230. Even if the defendants in all of these cases are going to win, just the fact that you've now set it up, that you have to litigate the question of 230 and then go to discovery, perhaps go to trial, uh, you know, all this stuff that is extremely expensive that will force most companies to either change their practices or sell Settle cases too early, even if they would have won in the long run, effectively wipes out the the tremendous value and benefits of Section 230. This episode of Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. Audit Pro from ACI Learning modernizes the way your team learns. Earn NASBA approved CPE credits through engaging training curriculum led by highly respected industry experts. With more than a 90% completion rate, Audit Pro courses are proven to be the most effective and efficient way to earn your CPE credits. Learn more at go.acilearning.com slash twit. 